Welcome in to Bears Weekly, a Chicago Bears Network production. Download the Chicago Bears official app, brought to you by Verizon, to follow the team on the go. Bears Weekly is brought to you by Advocate Healthcare, Bet Rivers, CDW, Connie's Pizza, and Miller Lite. Now it's time for Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears, Jeff Jonia, on the new Bears Radio Network. From sunny Arizona at the NFL owners' meetings, this is Bears Weekly with my partner Jim Miller from Sirius XM NFL Radio. I'm Jeff Joniak. Good to be with you. It's been a great week for the Bears and the rest of the National Football League. Learned a lot. Learned about what is ahead for the Bears in the upcoming draft, what happened in free agency, and what's still to come from the perspectives of General Manager Ryan Poles, Head Coach Matt Eberflus. We'll hear from Chairman of the Board George Hallis McCaskey and also the incoming new president, Kevin Warren, had a chance to meet with all of those individuals as well. Thanks to our producers, Dan Brilli and Jordan Treadup, Jake Cantu, and Nick Makzala, all helping us out here from Arizona. Overall perspectives, you talk to a lot of folks in the league and the Bears continue to be a hot topic, I'm sure. Yeah, I think, a lot. you know, just the general consensus, they like the moves that the Bears have made. They like the haul that they got in terms of the capital in, in the draft that they've uh, acquired, and I think they got a good player in, in D.J. Moore, and I think, you know, they've been very active in free agency, but I think they've been selective with guys they've gone after and targeted, obviously, the linebackers who we talked about uh, last week when you look at Edmonds and, and T.J. Edwards uh, coming in, so I think overall it's been a positive offseason so far for Chicago. Filling some needs, filling some holes, but they're cautioning that, yes, there are still a lot more work to do. We all know that. But getting the right type of guys is phenomenally important right now in this year two of this building plan, which will take some more time, even beyond this season. What's the step that you take with that in mind as you're a general manager and a head coach working so closely together here? Yeah, I, I think you want a very cohesive locker room. You know, and it, it, I've always said this, you know, good guys that, that work hard and, and have the same goal of what they uh, what, what they want to achieve, you can do some great things uh, in the NFL. And so I think they have been selective about the certain character of, of guys that they're bringing in the locker room. And they're, and they're not done. You know, I think we all know once you leave, uh, you know, Arizona, pretty much free agency is coming to a trickle. A lot of these teams are going to go back. They're going to get their boards. Uh, set and really the focus will be on the draft. Not that the Bears still won't be active in, in free agency. It's really about the number thing now. Look at the number of one-year deals that have been done this this past week alone. There's been like 50 one-year deals. So it's going to come in at, at a certain number. You know, even the, the receiver position and running back. I mean, Odell Beckham what's once was $20 million a year he wanted. Now is supposedly down to a, a $4 million one-year deal. So I think players got to get realistic. So they'll still target certain guys, but it's got to be at the number of uh, that the Bears want, and there's just there's not much out there because all the focus now will be on the draft. And, and when you talk about the draft, uh, obviously the line of scrimmage is still important. Ryan Poles mentioned that you'll hear about it later on in the program. That yes, that always is his focus. But there's also other premium positions. When you're at nine, if they assuming they stay there, you know the cornerback is is somebody that he feels is a premium position as well. W- where would you look with that pick? Would you? care what position it is or you're just getting the very best possible player no matter at one of the key premium positions yeah I, I still think they want to target areas of, of need I've, I've said that all the time what you miss out on free agency you've got to fill those holes to me through the draft and all these teams say well we try to position ourselves for the uh, best player available but if you go down and you look at the needs of, of certain teams I think we know like right at the top quarterback is a need of Carolina, right? That's why they traded up to one. They're drafting a, a quarterback. I think we assume it's a need uh, for Houston. We know it's a need for Indianapolis Colts, so that pushes good players down the board. Say uh, uh, a homegrown kid there plays at Illinois, like Witherspoon, the corner uh, that you're talking about, it could push him down uh, to that number nine spot. Uh, the Raiders potentially are in the mix for for quarterback at seven. That'll push uh, you know some of the good tackles that are that are out there that many think the, the Bears are targeting, whether it's Peter Skaroski from Northwestern, you've got Broderick Jones out there, very good player. How about the two Ohio State Paris tackles? Johnson. Paris Johnson and Dewan Jones, very good tackles that could be sitting there just staring the Bears right in the face. All right, well, Matt Eberflus uh, met the media this week at a morning breakfast, all the AFC coaches on one day, the NFC coaches on the next, and he jumped right in to take a look at exactly what the Bears have added so far. Excited about getting DJ Moore. I've had a chance to eat dinner with him and his family when he came in to sign. And uh, what an outstanding young man. And uh, he's really done a good job of uh, you know, producing 
with multiple quarterbacks. I mean, you look at his ability to produce, um, you know, yards per catch, yards after catch, route running ability, just outstanding. So we're, we're really excited about him and how he couples with the rest of our guys, you know, with uh, Claypool, Mooney, EQ, all the guys that we're going to have on our roster. I'm excited about that uh, for sure. And then really, you know, we get Bobby Tunyon. You know, it's uh, another big target um, that's uh, familiar with the offense. Um, that for us is really going to help us in the passing game. Um, I think he's coupled great with Cole. Uh, those two, one-two punch, you know, certainly in the third downs in the, in the red zone area where you need those guys, those big-bodied guys that are always open, that can big-body guys and, you know, big catch radius. You know, so we're excited about that. You know, and then moving to the backfield. You know, uh, Foreman's a, a big uh, runner. When he took over down there in Carolina, obviously showed what he could do. Uh, very exciting player, big back, um, can really split two and get those extra yards that you want him to. Um, you know, then Travis Homer is uh, really good too because uh, of his, his value as a runner, but also his value as a special teams guy. Um, obviously, you guys know I was with PJ. Uh, you know, he's an uh, outstanding young man again. Uh, really good support, you know, for Justin, and we're excited about that relationship being able to build. Um, and then I went against uh, Nate, you know, Nate Davis. All those years at, in Tennessee, went against him, and man, he's a he's an aggressive, R style type of player, can really move people at the second level. Um, and you know, the, I think the, the inside of the pocket, you know, is uh, sometimes underrated a little bit, you know, in terms of keeping that clean, you know, for quarterbacks because that's where direct pressure is. And uh, I think Nate does a really good job of being able to anchor, you know, uh, uh, you know redirect his balance when it gets off a little bit. Uh, but he's done a really good job with that and I had a nice meeting with him as well. Um, defensively, uh, obviously we'll start inside, you know, with Trey. Uh, Trey Edmonds, uh, outstanding young man. We obviously evaluated him when he came out and we loved him. I, mean, I was with Borgonzi, you know, back then. We evaluated him, had him super high, and we had the opportunity to get him. We were just really excited about that. And to me, his game is what just went, you know, he's gotten better and better and better. And I think his best year was last year. So we're excited about him. Playmaking ability also with Trey and also TJ. You, know, you can see TJ, local guy. Um, just the playmaking ability for him, his instincts, quickness, his strike. Um, really did a nice job of leading that. Philly defense, so we're excited about that. And then up front, you know, up front we just, you know, adding a piece inside, really to anchor that inside of that defense, that defense tackle with Andrew, uh, really good there. And then Demarcus, you know, from Tennessee, you can see his style. He's hard charging, um, ability to kick inside and pass downs. But we're excited about where he is. Um, again, another guy that, that, that fits our, our philosophy. Edmonds specifically, stylistically, what attracted you to him and where do you see him fitting best? Yeah, so, you know, with the depth chart right now, we're, you know, we're going to leave it open, but obviously, you know, you guys know what positions he's played. You know, he's played Mike Linebacker, um, so um, he's probably going to find his home there. Um, but he uh, is a big body guy. You know, if you talk, I've had several offensive coaches come up to me during the pro days and all that stuff, and, you know, and obviously Leslie Frazier, you guys know that he contacted me, and Bob Babich used to work here. He contacted me as well. But what the offensive coaches say, just that big body presence in the middle in between the hashes there, you know, that's where a lot of the throws go, and it really deters that. You know, with his size and length, and he has a tremendous range in there as, as a pass defender. Jim, more takeaways you know, he, he keeps emphasizing, and, and it's his experience, that year one to year two of the biggest jump for rookies. And he has commissioned these rookies at the exit meeting, along with Ryan Poles, to take on more leadership. That's the challenge for them because they know now what the schemes are, what the foundation looks like to bring in the next wave. Uh, that's important. Uh, he also, as you heard, touched on Chase Claypool, felt it was a little bit unfair uh, for him to just be dumped in there and – you know, learn everything, but he's optimistic because what they do have then is a bit of a basketball team of receivers. Mm -hmm. Different type sizes now with DJ Moore, which may elevate everybody else. Yeah, well, they do have big receivers. I believe Claypool, well over six foot. DJ Moore is well over six foot. Bayless Jones Jr. is no small peanut either. I mean, he's a he's a big receiver as well, and they got a big tight ends, in my opinion, when you look at the size of Cole Komet. So, yeah, they're kind of a basketball team uh, getting off the, uh, the bus. And you mentioned that jump from the first to the second year. One, you have comfortability in the scheme. 
as a player. So you're just you're more confident, you know, as a player. You just learn uh, the nuances, the ins and outs of what you're being asked to do. It registers a lot quicker. Things uh, start happening uh, faster, and that's going to be key for for Justin Fields. Now his second year in the system, how quickly can he get guys like Chase Claypool? elevate the play of Valus Jones Jr., guys that he's going to be working with moving forward like a, a, a Claypool or DJ Moore, and how comfortable and how quickly can these guys get on the, the same page. That's going to, really going to be the challenge uh, for, for Justin Fields because we all know. I mean, they had the last-ranked passing attack in the league last year. It's got to be better. They've got to be more productive in the passing game, and I think they're making strides to do that. And they'll work on it in the offseason program right away. More emphasis on the passing game to elevate that aspect of the Bears. When we return, we'll be listening to a conversation I had with Chairman of the Board, George Hallis McCaskey, here on Bears Weekly on ESPN Radio Chicago and the Chicago Bears Radio Network. NFL owners meetings from the perspective of one, the ownership family of the McCaskies, Mr. George Hallis McCaskey, kind enough to join us here on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, it's been a fun week for you guys. I know this is the, the, the big one, kind of. Every, everybody comes together here. Is it fun to mingle with the other owners and chop it up, as they say? Yeah, it's great to see everybody, and this is the big one. The NFL has quarterly meetings, but this is the meeting where uh, most of the rules proposals uh, get considered, uh, the playing rules proposals, and um, some – other administrative stuff, but um, this is where most of the discussion is, most of the debate is. I know you were at the Combine at least a little bit, but Ryan Poles was the center of the football universe. His picture <laughs> was everywhere. Uh, I don't know if you're on Twitter ever, but he, he's all over. There are memes and pictures, and it, it's crazy. And I've used the term center of the football universe because with that number one pick and the optimism about the future and Justin Fields and the assets and – it's been some kind of several weeks here from our perspective. How about yours from the top down? Yeah, I follow on Twitter, there follow only, <laughs> and uh, see a lot of traffic on uh, Ryan. Um, he's uh, the man of the hour yeah. right now. A lot of um, speculation out, out there about what we were going to do with the top pick, and I thought he did a great job um, analyzing the possibilities and what was best for the Bears and uh, made a good move. And now we need to make the most of those picks that we got in trade. And I think with Ryan's team and Matt's team, uh, we'll be in good shape there. First time, I believe since 1947 that the pick was the Bears at number one. It's awful tempting to stay there at times, but with the idea that he is going to be a draft-driven general manager and he's sticking to that, to the T, I believe, and being smart and look for value in free agency, uh, this couldn't be a better opportunity for the Bears to in a sense, load up a little bit for the future. Yeah, that's that's the key is, um, is there somebody there that you really like um, that you think can really help the club? Or um, is it better for the club in the short term and the long term um, to get picks and um, help yourselves in a number of areas? Um, I had a lot of people coming to me when we had the number one pick saying, oh, you need to trade down, you need to trade down. I said, okay. How far down would you go? Because yeah. that's another key consideration. Yeah. And I think we're at a good spot at nine. And uh, if he sees a player he likes at nine, um, we'll go get him. Um, otherwise, who knows? Uh, he, Maybe another trade. It, there, I, I wouldn't put it past him. Let, let's look at this now. 36-year-old general manager, I believe, or 37. But he's a young general manager. There's a whole cachet of young general managers coming into the league. And, you know, y you never really know what you're going to get when the and the, you know the decisions have to be made what has been your impression through this now year long plus process of watching him deconstruct and construct the next roster for the Chicago Bears yeah well i think he's all of 37 now okay 37 um, but he's uh, certainly got a bearing we're not by the way <laughs> <laughs> he's certainly got a bearing and a manner of somebody um, well beyond 37 um, he's very thoughtful very methodical, and one of the things I like about him the best is that he he exudes calm. Um, you know, he's in a business where there's a lot of chaos circling all the time, and he's just a picture of calm. And I think his people pick up on that, and uh, that the Bears are better for it. I've always felt instincts should rule the day, 
if you believe in somebody enough to say, okay, he is my next general manager, he's my next head coach, you have to trust them. And I know that's the organizational philosophy of the Bears all the way down the line with managers. You know, you, you bring in the people you believe in, let them do their jobs, let them trust their instincts. I've been texting him nonstop, trust your instincts. Is that key to this? Because you have to have a strong belief in a philosophy in order to do any decision-making. Because if you're wishy-washy, it trickles down all the way to your roster in the locker. I think great instincts are part of the job description, but um, you also have to have uh, the data, the analytics, and you need somebody with a cold, cool, um, measured mind to analyze that data, um, bring in the instincts when necessary to make the right decisions. All right, so Papa Bear, I don't know what he would have thought of analytics. Now, he was cutting edge, just like, Others were in the beginnings of, of this uh, great sport, but Ryan has mentioned and pointed out the staff, business analytics now in football. How have you embraced all of that and learned about that in, in terms of making decisions business-wise or, or personnel-wise, football-wise? I think you've got to embrace it. Yeah. Um, George Hallis's legacy is one of innovation, and I think he would have welcomed the analytics side of it. Uh, we just had a great pres presentation last week prior to the meetings uh, by Harry Freed, our football analytics guy, about um, some of the rules proposals and um, some of the officiating uh, techniques and mechanics and so forth. And uh, it was fascinating the way he broke it down. And uh, I think that's what you need. Again, you got to have the data got to have the analytics you got to have the facts to make good decisions guys like me though we're with uh, george hallis mccaskey chairman of the board of the chicago bears here on bears weekly on espn 1000 and the bears radio network sometimes i go kicking and screaming into the future because all my sport i like it the way it was right i, I don't like uh <laughs> what's going on in college necessarily with the conferences and baseball constantly making changes i'd like to keep our game the way it was right but it's always going to be tweaked and changed where are you on that as, as a member of this family and this organization, the charter franchise of the NFL, as it adjusts the game? And I'll tell you why I bring it up after you answer. Well, we're traditionalists. We like yes. The, um, things the way they were. Um, but you've got to be open to change. You've got to be open to growth, to evolution. Uh, you mentioned the college game. There's a lot going on there with the transfer portal and uh, name and image and likeness um, initiatives and so forth. And uh, there's a lot going on in, in the program. And quite frankly, it's a different player now than it was before. And, yeah. and you've got to adapt to that. So I saw Virginia McCaskey, your mother, at the Ed Black Courage Award. And she was delightful, excited to talk about what's going on. I said, hey, this is crazy. We got this. We got that. She goes, yep. Just tell me who's starting on the first game of the year. <laughs> then I'll, then I'll, but the change, I mean, the change, I think, is blurring for someone of, of her experience level in this sport. Yeah, she's, uh, you talk about a, a cool, level-headed <laughs> person. Um, you know, she doesn't get caught up in all the emotion. She's, you know, uh, when's the next game? Um, right. How soon is the next game? Right. At 100, let's yeah. underline that. It, yeah. It's amazing how she just processes. But the little conversations I've had with her over the years, smart as a whip. Yep, very much, very much on. on top of it, very much into it, and uh, we're all very grateful for that. All right. Top down, uh, give us a little bit of a, uh, a state of the franchise from your perspective right now. Uh, well, it's been a quiet off season. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, new president, uh, land purchase, uh, top pick in the draft, you know, the usual mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of buzz, a um, lot of talk uh, about the Bears, which is great. A um, lot of people with a lot of opinions about what we should be doing, not just with the pick, but with everything else. And uh, it's very exciting. Um, really looking forward to uh, what lies ahead. 3-14 and 14 was not fun, yet no. the fan base was not wigged out about it, so to speak. They're excited about what's coming. I think Justin's development over the course of last season has everybody perched, waiting to see what's next. Are you in that same position? Yeah, that, that's a key for us is um, we've gotten Justin some help. Um, now we need to keep developing him, um, let him grow into the job. Um, he understands what it's, what's necessary. Um, he understands 
what it means to be the starting quarterback of the Chicago Bears, and and that's huge. So um, really looking forward. Yeah, uh, you know, Matt Eberflus, we got to also bring into this conversation because how he works with Ryan and vice versa is critical moving forward. They seem to be in lockstep. They spent a ton of time together. They were very pleased with the process of getting ready for free agency. They struck quickly, but smartly and with value in mind, but getting some key players for the future at an age which is perfect for this kind of situation. Would you agree with all that? And what are your perspectives on watching those two work together? Yeah, uh, they're working very well together. The communication is excellent. Uh, we want healthy debate. We don't want them always agreeing. Yeah. Um, but there, there's good discussion, good decision-making going on. And, um, yeah, attracting and, um, and lining up good players for our Bears. Next month, Kevin Warren moves into a day-to-day role with the organization. Uh, how has he been ramping up, and what have your conversations been like with Kevin? Yeah, April 17th start date, but he's been in the building uh, many times, has had good transition meetings with Ted Phillips, um, our senior vice presidents, um, our department heads. I think things are going very smoothly there. I'm looking forward to him getting started. In the introductory news conference and a, and a conversation I had with him that was, um, you know, we talked about Arlington and he was very excited about it. Now you guys own the property. It's closed. And I did ask him, I said, the development of that, is that critical to the future of the organization? And he said it was. Where are we at on that? And is it still um, a a day-by-day pursuit in terms of how to figure all this out? Well, as you mentioned, we've closed on the property. That's an important step, but it is just another step. There's a lot of uh, analysis that needs to be done. Um, Kevin will be leading that effort. Um, He has the benefit of the experience with U.S. Bank in Minneapolis when he was with the Vikings. He'll, he'll bring um, his experience and his reasoned approach, um, but we still have a lot of information to gather before we decide whether we're going to develop the property and if we develop the property, if that development is going to include a stadium. If I had to put you on the spot in terms of optimism, would you say you are optimistic? Or is there another word for it that you would choose to use? I'm trying to be optimistically <laughs> pragmatic. <laughs> that's, that's perfect because you have to be. Yeah. You have to be pragmatic. But I think fans are stirred up. They're excited about the potential. Yeah, it, it, it's a long process, um, and, and there's a lot that we need to work through. All right, let's look at the league. I just saw this the other day. It reminded me that the TV contracts are set through 2033. The addition of Amazon has been a huge boost. Uh, I think the labor agreement's set through 2030. Is this one of the healthiest periods in your recollection where the league is at right now? Roger Goodell uh, potentially could be getting a new contract moving forward. He's done a great job for for the league and the owners and the fans. What's your perspective on where the league's at right this minute? Uh, We're in a good spot. Um, Labor peace is essential to the league's success. Um, It's very helpful that we have uh, lucrative uh, broadcast and uh, streaming deals, uh, but the commissioner is constantly advising us we cannot be complacent. Um, the way he puts it is we need to look around corners, um, and and he's been reminding it, us of that on a regular basis. Put that in context, looking around corners. Um, yet to be prepared for uh, the unexpected. Um, you know, he has pointed to... Uh, Boxing, for instance, which used to be a huge sport in this I country. It. Um, and now it's, mm-hmm. it's still popular, but um, not what it once was. Um, so, yes, we're enjoying great popularity, but we can never take that for granted. We always need to be vigilant, constantly striving to improve our great game. And the look beyond uh, the states here, obviously, Europe big. The marketing deals with uh, Spain and London for the Bears and other other countries with uh, at that deal with uh, the Rams with China, for example. How do you feel about that? And with the games expanding to Germany, uh, and who knows what's next? Uh, is that a, a front of the next stage of the NFL development? Yeah, so the NFL is seeking to become a global brand, um, and part of it is what we call this international home market initiative. And the Bears are focusing on the U.K., and Spain. Um, we're, we're sharing those um, international markets with a number of other teams. Um, and there are uh, 
number of teams involved in countries all over the world, including Africa. So, um, yeah, that, that's a big horizon for the league. Training camp around the corner. Looking forward to it. It's hard knocks in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, that's where we're trying to be realistically pragmatic. Uh, we're one of four teams that can be compelled to participate. And so that's a discussion we need to have with uh, Ryan and Matt and um, see where we are on that. Thank you so much. Always enjoy the conversation. Appreciate it. Go Bears. That's George Hallis McCaskey. We'll continue with Jim Miller here on Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000 and the Chicago Bears Radio Network. Welcome back to Bears Weekly with Jim Miller from Sirius XM NFL Radio's Moving the Chains. I'm Jeff Joniak. Uh, we're going to listen in to Kevin Warren here in a minute from his uh, session with the media. But first, I got to tell you this. I think I mentioned this to you at the owner's party a couple of nights ago, which was awesome, by the way. Uh, and thank you for spending a little time with the, the little people like myself. I, I appreciate it very much. Walked with him to the session that you're about to hear with the Chicago media, and I could not believe how many people this man knows. Mm. Honestly, he stops and shakes hands with everybody. They recognize him. He recognizes them. It, it does speak to his experience in the league, but also his role as a Big Ten commissioner. Um, have you had any conversations with him and have you had any discussions on Sirius XM just about you know his role coming in here to replace the outgoing Ted Phillips yeah I think uh, you know he's no new or he's no newbie in NFL circles you know like he's gone through this process before with the Minnesota Vikings and the challenge of of building a, a new stadium so he's got great rapport and great relationships at the NFL level and so you know I don't you know he's been on the the radar I mean there was actually talk that potentially he could supplant Roger Goodell as NFL commissioner uh, believe it or not that was that was out there so this is a guy that's been groomed he's He's been well thought of uh, for a long time, and I think, like you said, you you see, you know, you see the really the credibility that he brings uh, to the Chicago Bears and the challenge that he's already been through, and I think he'll accomplish this challenge that he's facing in Chicago. Obviously, a lot of questions about the Arlington Park property, but also just about the culture that he wants to see with the Chicago Bears. I think everything in my job is 100 percent. So basically, <laughs> running the day-to-day -day operations, the football, the um, you know, the stadium and just really even, you know, culture. And so the good thing about it, uh, I am so passionate. I don't even look at this as a job. You know, this is a way of life. For, fortunately, my family, my wife, we've grown up around it. And, uh, you know, this is a passion project. And, and uh, I am so excited uh, to be a member of the Chicago Bells franchise. What do you mean by culture? What's, what, what kind of culture do you want to build? I mean, culture. I mean, we, we need to build a, a championship culture. Um, always, I'm a big believer that uh, you have to be comfortable in talking about winning a championship and not, not just talking about it, but putting in the work to be able to do it. Uh, I'm starting my one-on-one -on -one in interviews, as I said in my press conference with every employee. I'm starting them on the 17th, and we're putting the list together now. And I think the biggest thing that people will feel from me is that uh, I, 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 I want to be a champion, and uh, you know, collectively, and I want us to do it uh, together. And uh, this is not about force and coercion. This is just about setting a vision, you know, plan, working hard, being a leader, um, being supportive, supporting people individually, their families, and just making an environment. I want people when they wake up in the morning, whether you're a player, a coach, a staff member, even ownership, that you're excited to go to work. And, uh, and, and, and that's the environment that, that I look forward to creating. So, uh, a couple more guys. What, what did you learn in Minnesota about the, the methodology of funding billion dollar projects? Mm -hmm. Is, is I think the biggest thing I learned is that you have to uh, simplify it uh, to, to make it make sense from a basic standpoint. Um, you know, because if you look at the numbers sometimes, they can be a little overwhelming at every level. But I think what it comes down is to focus on the why. You know, why is it important? And all you, you all have had a chance to go to U.S. Bank Stadium. You think about the impact that it's had, you know, in Minnesota. One, just from a pride standpoint. You know, people are, are prideful uh, about a new stadium. And then the host the NCAA Final Four and Super Bowls and all the other events and, and watch your kids playing baseball and having midnight baseball games there and, and the things that come along with it. It's, it's, a, it's a pride point. Uh, also what it, it did in Minnesota, it actually was a great recruiter for businesses, even if you weren't going to a, um, a, a game there. And so those are things that as we design this whole ecosystem uh, with our stadium in Arlington Park is that we have to create that environment where people when they come uh, to visit, 
uh, in Chicago that they want to they want to come see the new Chicago Bears Stadium and what it means and and work for companies there and and, and all that and and uh, so that's that's the that's the part that's so exciting about it. It's much more just than than a building. I mean, really, it's building a, a kind of an energy center, and then it does have a positive impact. The, the draft will be your major mm-hmm. football. Uh, activity when you, when you start. Mm-hmm. When you were talking with Ryan and Matt, what do you want to know about players and, and what's kind of your role you think in that room as they're making these, some of these decisions? I mean, you, you want to you build your roster um, uh, with championship uh, quality individuals. Individuals who love the game of football. Uh, not being, not love the game of football because of the, all the ancillary items that come along with it or love to say they're NFL player, but truly love to compete. You know, I love highly competitive people uh, who do things the right way, you know, who want to work hard, um, to be diligent, to be uh, strong in the community, uh, just to really do the right thing. And I've just seen it happen. I saw it happen when we were uh, in St. Louis. I saw it happen, you know, in Minnesota. When you get that group of of men together who really are focused and it's not about the position or your salary that you come to together that we're going to do something special you know you can really change the world i mean that's the thing about you know sports and energy and being around here at the league meetings and watching the videos and you know see it happen I said it before there's going to be the playoffs next year there's going to be you know a super bowl next year uh, it's not like they're going to, you know, we're not going to play games. So, and everyone's zero zero right now. And so what we have to do is just continually pull together, get better, make progress each and every single day and bring uh, men into the building who are really focused and proud to be a Chicago Bears. And that's why I said every time I walk in the building, you know, I look at that uh, statue of George Hollis and I ask myself going in today to ask God to give me the strength uh, to do what I need to do to make him proud. And I ask the same thing. Uh, there have been many a days that I've stopped in the, in the chapel there to pray. But before I go home, I look at that statue and I ask myself, if he had been with me every, uh, every moment of that day, would he be proud of what I did? And if we, if we get a collective group of people who can do that every single day, we'll all uh, be proud of the work that we're going to put in here over the next couple of years. Given how things uh, were laid out for this off season, uh, the idea was, the projection was the Bears were going to be like the center of the football universe a little bit. Have you felt that? And now, yes. I mean, I, I, you know, it's interesting, and and I feel coming back to the NFL, and even <laughs> so many people that I've seen said, "Welcome back home," and uh, and I feel that this is home. But I also feel, you know, it's interesting how. Um, even coming here for the meetings, it's something special with the Chicago Bears. I mean, th- this is not a normal environment of a team that won three football games last year that you would think most of the times that happens, you're in turmoil. But George is calm. Ryan is calm. Uh, Coach Eberflus is calm. I'm calm. Uh, we're all connected and working together. And I think there's a sense around the NFL community that uh, we have the right people at the right time, in the right situation, focus on the right issues, and none of us have egos and that we're doing the right thing. So I, I, am, I, I really love the energy that we have developed and building, and I'm confident that we're going we're gonna to do well together. How much do you lean on the league in terms of helping you with stadium-type issues? I mean, I, I, I think I have always been in my career, especially in the NFL, a person that has great respect uh, for the National Football League. I have great respect for Commissioner Goodell and the staff he's assembled and for the National Football League. I know for me, uh, it's always, you know, uh, they're a resource. And so I'm excited. I mean, one of the things that just uh, just has been reiterated to us in these meetings, the National Football League is a resource. They're not an adversary. They're in our corner. Uh, they have a vested interest, just like the other teams, uh, for us to do well together. One thing I also I learned in Minnesota, when you asked me, one of the things I learned is that was the time that we had to come together because we visited all the other stadiums. We talked about it. People have given insight. Even since I've been here, people have said, hey, if you have new thought process or want to bounce things off of us, we're here. So the National Football League is a collective family. We compete on game day, obviously. Uh, but from a business standpoint, that's what makes it so special. Uh, it makes it greater than any other league is that collaboration of be able to share revenues from a national standpoint to be able to work together. And everyone in the National Football League is excited on making sure that the Chicago Bears has an absolutely incredible 
stadium development uh, because it's right for the NFL. Coming up next, we'll hear from General Manager Ryan Poles, his State of the Union, heading into the draft season. With Jim Miller, I'm Jeff Joniak here on ESPN Chicago and the Chicago Bears Radio Network. Back with you from Arizona at the NFL Owners Meetings, wrapping up this week. Uh, with Jim Miller, I'm Jeff Joniak, and really enjoyed it this week. Uh, coaches, talk to Ron Rivera, had breakfast with him. First thing out of his mouth, you're going to love DJ Moore. Yeah, coach him in Carolina. Yeah, it's a, I think he's a true number one. I mentioned it uh, uh, last week when when we did the show that you know if you look at his first five years, four of the five should be over a thousand yards. You know if they didn't have issues at the quarterback position, even last Played year for eight different quarterbacks. Yeah, I know in it's, his career. It's but hard. He still had four <laughs> digits. Yeah, and the, this guy can go get it. He's capable of big plays. And I I did comparison of explosive plays to to Tyree Kill compared to Waddle. He's right up really? there in terms of his plus uh, twenty yard gains and plus 40-yard gains. So he's an explosive player. You know, his numbers uh, suggest that, and I think why, you know, that ends up being a, just a really good trade uh, for, for the Chicago Bears. I mean, Carolina did not want to part with that player. You know, because here they're going to draft a young quarterback. They want to surround their young quarterback with good players, much like the Bears. But what did they do in free agency? Once D.J. Moore came over to the Bears, they go and sign two veteran receivers, right? Adam Thielen, and they just signed D.J. Chark. So they feel that they're good enough now to insulate a young quarterback. And the Bears, I thought, they got a nice weapon for their young quarterback that's looking to grow and take the next step in the NFL. That was a good get. Let's hear more from the general manager, Ryan Poles. As a club, you know, we're happy with the progress that we're making, uh, but at the same time, we know we've got a long ways to go uh, to get this roster to where it needs to be. But what's been cool is we've used, you know, different methods to improve with, you know, the trade, um, which really I talked about before a little bit of, you know, uh, how can we work on our roster today with, with DJ Moore and draft picks this year, but also for the future. I think it sets us up nicely. Uh, and then for agency, um, really – Wanted to marry um, need and value um, and where that came together, and I thought we did that well. And again, on paper right now, we're better than what we were before, um, but we all understand we've got a long way to go. And uh, when we get back from here, we'll hit the draft, lock in the draft room. We took a, re- a couple really good trips, saw some, some guys that we like, got some clarity on some things what, by meeting with the players. So uh, we're about to turn the page into the draft and, and take that next step. Right, knowing how your vision is to build through the draft. How do you describe the significance of what will happen those three days in late April and what it means for what you want to build? Yeah, it's just adding to the core of, of players that we want to win, you know, here with for a long period of time. Um, you know, we have some needs that we got to fill. Um, but again, it's staying disciplined and, and really using the draft board and, and the value system that we have to, to do the right thing in the draft as well. But this continues to set it up, set it up for, you know, the, this long journey that we have. At, at nine. You still have confidence that you'll get one of those seven guys that you identified? Is that kind of what your thought process is? Yeah, it'd be awesome if, if it was. Um, you know, usually in the that first round area, you have multiple tiers in the first round that you're looking at. Um, but I'm confident we can get a good player. When we talked to you a couple weeks ago, we didn't bring up Justin very much at all. Yep. What was his reaction to the trade and, and just kind of the um, – you know, the dance you had to do for six weeks, eight weeks, yeah. letting him know that he was valued but also not ruling out anything publicly. Yeah, like I mentioned before, communication was good with him, kind of let, letting him know. Um, but also I, I was honest with you can't completely shut the door either because you just don't know how this thing's going to play out. Um, but his reaction, I let him know when the trade went down and DJ was coming in. Uh, I didn't get a response for a while, so I said, are you sleeping? And <laughs> and then he actually was. He took a nap. So he woke <laughs> up and he was pumped up. So, um you know, he got to connect with DJ, and, and he's fired up. What could this do for him just having extra weapons? Um, yeah. Obviously, you got to fix the blocking part, but, yeah. but the skill position. Yeah, it's just another playmaker on the field. Uh, the one thing I really like is we have three different types of receivers. We have a, a guy that's a big body guy that can play inside, outside. We have Mooney who can separate and run vertically and make plays. And then DJ just a strong physical guy that can separate. Um, make plays after the catch too. So I like how everything's set up, and then you throw Cole in the mix too. So he has weapons. Uh, we got to continue to work up front and, and get better there too. What did you like about Deontay Foreman and what he brings? Yeah, I like the style. You know, the style uh, and the scheme. You know, that fits well. Good vision, burst. Um, I love that he can finish runs with with speed. So um, he'll have a good opportunity to help us out. Yeah, I think it's healthy to have you know two back system. You know, guys that can rotate in and out different styles. Um, like we've had before, um, where one will kind of 
more of a physical downhill guy, and then the other one can pop long runs and be explosive. So uh, we'll continue to do that, and uh, hopefully we have success there. I know you said before the goal was to keep David Montgomery. Yeah. What, was there a breakdown in negotiations or anything like that? Yeah, I, I would just kind of sum it up by saying, you know, players do have a choice. Um, I thought we communicated well. I thought we ne negotiated well. Um, at the same time, you don't always know what's going on in the background, but I thought we we did a good job. We, we were transparent. We were organized, and it just it didn't happen. I felt like it was really, really close, though. Right, with, with Jalen Carter. Describe the complexity of the process here down the stretch of making sure you guys have the most informed yeah. review going into draft weekend. Yeah, it's a big puzzle. Each each prospect is a big puzzle. Um, you usually take it all the way back to high school, how they were recruited, how they handled that. Um, and now you kind of play it through their their career, and you know there's sometimes there's red flags that pop up, and you got to sit down and have discussions with different party organizations to say, does this guy fit what we're trying to do? Uh, you look at the risk, uh, you got to balance that. And again, for us, especially being so young, we want to make sure we're keeping a, a good culture and maintain this as we go. So um, when we get back here, we'll put it all on the table and, and figure that out. From the trips you guys did go on, did you come away um, with? information that give you more excitement encouragement about what you're ultimately going to wind up getting yeah um you want to be careful though like the further you get away from tape you know the workouts and shorts and all that can sway you a little bit too far so you kind of want to stay in the same range but we learned a lot more about the players um, a couple of them we met early got them on the board talked ball got uh, our coordinators our position coaches with them just to get familiar sometimes we just went to dinner to to feel the person um, so we definitely feel better about it now than we did before and I think the cool thing is um, it's really weird you get this job and you just take off and you run you don't spend a ton of quality time with you know your coordinators and sometimes even your head coach um, so the time spent with you know our offensive defensive line coaches or coordinators just sitting on the plane at dinner um, that part was cool too, just bonding as a group. Is it by accident that there are four or five kids now from the Chicago area on this team, or is there something to it for you? No, there's something to it for me. Uh, I think when you have pride of, of your local team that you grew up watching, you knew what you know this club meant to the city, and you saw um, some good times and some good players. I think you're a little bit more motivated to perform at a high level, and um, and also lead because you've seen guys do it at high level before you. So um, I always like that aspect. I think it just means a little bit more. All right, some other things uh, that were mentioned later. Again, these were 20-minute conversations. We're just giving you clips about it. And the philosophy on the offensive line, to keep the guys where they play the best. He says most have played both sides of the line. Some of these guys have played inside and out. Feels that what they have now, they can move around and find the best five. And it could include... As already has been mentioned, Cody Whitehair possibly to center there with Lucas Patrick in a competition. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, again, you, you like you said, it. you got to get the best five out there. Now, which is the best position for him? I thought Tevin Jenkins had a really good year at, at right guard. But can he kick out to right tackle? Yeah, I think he could probably do that uh, if need be, if they're in a pinch. Do they want uh, Nate uh, uh, Davis at uh, right guard, or will you move Tevin Jenkins over to uh, to left guard? That could be solidify the interior with Cody Whitehair at center, and then the decision will have to be made of, of Braxton Jones, who did grade out higher than any tackle last year as a rookie. You know, he had the most snaps, um, and obviously the way the, the Bears ran the football, do they feel comfortable with him at left tackle, or potentially, as we mentioned, could they really solidify it with a guy like Broderick Jones, who's probably the, the top tackle uh, coming out in this year's draft? The guy's got, like, dancing bare feet. And those are the decisions they're, they're going to have to make. You know, which is the best way to go about it to get the best five out there and where they, they fit on the field? So I think all those things are being discussed right now, and that will really thrust them in what, you know, where they're going to choose and who they choose, you know, come that first pick at number nine overall, or potentially do you trade down and still get one of those top now, tackles? He does say at nine and later in the second round, he feels confident they can address their needs at offense and tackle and get some good players. One more segment to go here from Arizona at the NFL owners meetings with Jim Miller from Sirius XM NFL radio. I'm Jeff Joniak here on ESPN Chicago and the Chicago Bears radio network. With Jim Miller, I'm Jeff Joniak. One of the big things talking to other coaches in the AFC and the NFC is just the consistency of calls. While Roger Goodell said the refereeing in 2022 was outstanding, coaches still believe there's too much uncertainty, and it, it should look 
the same to everybody watching it. Yeah, well, well I think we know that they need more consistency, and, and everything wasn't. That's fine to, uh, for Roger Goodell to really classify it that way, but I think we know it wasn't all that great because when you have Mike Vrabel, who's on the head of the competition committee, he sent out a mass email to all of the coaches and everybody in the NFL that we need more consistency with these officials, and here's why. One, you've had a lot of turnover from officials. Two, where are they recruiting these officials from? Because I think we know when you look at the Power Five conferences uh, in college football, the Big Ten and SEC, those officiating crews are a lot better than some of the other crews. And I'm not trying to, to bash the SWAC or the MAC or anything like that. It's just a, a, a better brand of football that happens at a better pace just due to the uh, to the talent levels. And so the NFL is recruiting these young officials that really, with all the rules changes, there's there's you know time, you've got to be patient, but you've got to groom them and grow them as young officials to replace, you know, there's been pretty much a 50% turnover over the last, I'd say, four years of officials in the NFL, and I think f- uh, four more retired this year. It doesn't happen overnight. Here, one of the reasons why we're here in Arizona is they've got, what, more rules proposals. So we don't take out any rules, Jeff. We just <laughs> add to them. So the rule book gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it puts more responsibility and more pressure on these officials who they're trying to develop. All right, there's so many. But just let's touch on defensive pass interference because it's for as long as we've watched the game, for as long as you've played the game, that has been a subjective foul. Yeah. Can you make it less subjective? And particularly, as Vrabel pointed out, these 50-50 balls. We all want 50-50 mm-hmm. receivers, the big guys that can battle a mm-hmm. cornerback. But let, let's yeah. make it fair on the penalty. And Mike insinu- you know, insinuated there in, in his comments because what happens on those long pass plays it becomes a spot foul. I've always been the, the proponent, just make it a 15-yard penalty. because It's, it, it's grossly unfair. Yeah, it's such yeah. a momentum-changing play when you look at that. But, you know, some of these teams that have proposals, whether it's uh, the Detroit Lions about challenges, other teams, the Rams have a, a proposal, uh, you know, about really – allowing the coach to challenge everything. If you remember, it was actually in this building about 10 years ago, Bill Belichick put that proposal on the board. Say, hey, just allow coaches to challenge anything. You know, whether it's roughing the passer, whether it's a, a, a pass interference call, and the coach maybe disagrees with it, or it's a momentum-changing play that the coach should be able to challenge it, and who knows, maybe it gets overturned with replay. But I think but it doesn't was... doesn't that bog the game down to a snail's pace? I think, well, I think if you're if you keep the same amount of challenges, if the coach gets the challenge wrong obviously he loses that challenge in the timeout and right now they only have two challenges but but you're saying though Mm -hmm. as belichick inferred 10 years ago to have everything challengeable yeah wouldn't that bog the game down i i I personally don't think so okay and i think if a coach uh if the coach wins the 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 challenge he should be able to allowed to challenge as much as much as he wants i don't think coaches would abuse it coaches want to get it right i think fans want to get it right i think we all want to see the the correct call and if you have that ability to challenge you're you're probably going to get it right and coaches won't abuse it i really don't believe that coaches won't just be throwing challenge flags just to do it because there is a point where they run out of them and they won't be able to do it. It's just the, the momentum changing plays is what they want the ability to challenge to get it right. All right, Big Jim, as we say goodbye, I, I keep using this term. I kind of like it. I think we should make shirts. The Bears are poised to make some noise. Yeah. The I, more you learn, the more you learn this week, you've been at pro days, you've been at the combine, you've been at the senior bowl. Mm-hmm. Now the evaluation process, get the board stacked exactly. Where, are they poised to make some more noise? Yeah, I do. I think they're, you know, they're going to be very active uh, in the draft. I think they know what players uh, they want to go after, and that's really. I always say this. Everybody just thinks, all right, there's, you know, 319 guys are invited to the combine. There's only 276 draft picks, and there's basically well eight rounds when you count the compensatory picks. All right, so you're going to target 10 guys each round, you know, and that's why. To me, when you look at trades, when guys move up and down, they're trying to do what? Target the guys that they're going to select, that they want to select. You know, So if we go through round one, the Bears probably have 10 guys say, hey, we, we want a minimum – one of these five guys are our premium guys that we want to go after. So maybe from nine, they, they go down to, say, 16 to target a player right where that sweet spot could be or where they believe he could he could fall in the draft. And that's what it is. It's about positioning to target the guys that you want to select and come out of each round with a certain person that you're looking for. Thanks for all your time. Appreciate it. You bet, Jeff. Good Big be Jim Miller from SiriusXM NFL Radio. Thanks, everybody, for listening tonight, and thanks to our producers, Jordan Tredup and Dan Barilli, Jake 
Cantu and Nick Moxzala as well at ESPN 1000 in Chicago. Coming up next, Bleck and Abdallah. Thanks for listening from the NFL owners meetings in Phoenix, Arizona. That'll do it tonight on Bears Weekly on the Bears Radio Network. Thank you for listening to the Chicago Bears Network presentation of Bears Weekly. Podcasts are available on the Chicago Bears official app. Brought to you by Verizon and Apple Podcasts. Bears Weekly has been brought to you by Bet Rivers and Miller Lite.